we're recording this uh, webinar and it'll be available online in the next day or two. There'll be three presentations of eight to 10 minutes in length and the remaining time will be for questions. If you have a question, the way you do that in the GoToWebinar is that you type it into the chat box. As time allows, we'll try to work through the questions and if we can, unmute your microphone so you can actually speak your question. Over to you, Steve. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm Steve Waddell. I've been leading the organizing of the STG Transformation Forum and these webinars as a part of that. And we're welcoming uh, three great guests today uh, to talk about uh, what they're doing uh, on this topic of uh, meta narratives and transformation. Uh, prior to this, uh, when we when we sent out the description of the uh, event today, um, I had some feedback from a physical scientist because there's lots of physical scientists in. Uh, Future Earths Network, and her question was, what does all this mean? Do all these words make any sense in this description? I can't get it. Uh, and it made me realize that sometimes I do talk to uh, the converted or the people who are just engaged in this. And of course, a meta narrative's key success is broadening the engagement beyond those who are keenly working on its development. But we do need these new stories, these narratives, new stories to drive transformation change. So that's why it's so critical to this question about the SDGs and transformation. Uh, how do we actually envision uh, moving to sustainable development? Lots of people are working on that, of course. And out of that, we can see emerging new insights and ideas about how to uh, frame and guide action and what the actual sort of ground rules are about the new world that we're transforming to. So we have three people who are intimately engaged in uh, thinking about what we're moving to and helping us to describe it and to uh, make that something that is engaging and useful for the broad population. So uh, first of all, we'll hear from Hunter Lovins. I had the pleasure of meeting her a couple of times. Uh, I went to the Leading for Wellbeing, as it's now called, uh, initiating meeting about um, 16 months ago or so in New York. And Hunter has had a leading role in developing this initiative, Leading for Wellbeing, as a meta narrative. And you might know her uh, from her natural capitalism work. Certainly, uh, she's also involved in many different organizations, such as the, uh, she's a member of the um, uh, many different organizations. So, Hunter, shall we hear from you first? Tell us what's happening with uh, Leading for Wellbeing and what it's all about. Sure. Thanks, Steve. And hopefully uh, you all can see my screen. Now, I'm going to move that little guy over to the side. We're in trouble. We, as, as a world, we face daunting challenges. We now have the capacity as humans to destroy life on Earth. Uh, Stuart Brand once said, we are as gods and had better get good at it. Tom Barry said we're in trouble because we don't have a good story. We had a story and it told us who we were and what our place in the world was. That story is breaking down. It's breaking down in part because of the challenges we face. Everything from staggering inequality, the latest Oxfam numbers are that eight men have as much wealth as half the population. Eight men. And the inequality is getting worse. Last year, the number was 85 people had as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion poorest. Climate change. My uh, so-called president has just told us or stated he's going to pull us out of Paris. Climate doesn't care what the politicians do. It's continuing to warm. And that's an existential threat for humanity. And I could spend the entire hour going through the problems we're facing. But I think it's worth asking, how the hell did we get here? Because particularly in the context of narrative, we got here because 36 men got together in 1947 at a hotel outside Montreux, Switzerland, and they built the narrative that now runs our world. 
They called it neoliberalism. It's based on the notion that your individual freedom is the only thing that matters in a manifestly perfect market. Because markets are perfect, any government interference is a bad idea. And let's go, the markets will solve everything. They built this narrative, they argued for 10 days, built the narrative, built the Chicago School of Economics, built the Mont Pelerin Society, but it remained a fairly wonkish ideology until in 1971, a man named Lewis Powell wrote a memorandum of how the US Chamber of Commerce could take this narrative and embody it in policy. On the strength of that, five outfits, I believe Olin, Coors, Scaife, Bradley, and the Koch brothers put each $5 million for each of five years into building Hudson, Heritage, Hoover, American Enterprise, Cato. They built the thought institutions that then started rolling out policy. Fast forward to today, when Mr. Trump walked into the Oval Office, deer in the headlights, oh my God, what do I do now? I just won. Heritage Foundation handed him his playbook. Here's what you do for the first 100 days. So if you've ever wondered why is it that Trump ran on a whole set of campaign promises and is governing in a very different way, it's because he got handed the story. What happened after Powell wrote his memo was the neolibs organized, they got Reagan elected in the US, Thatcher in the UK, and neoliberalism became the dominant narrative the world around. Our challenge now is to build a new narrative. Here's the way that uh, the world works. You, me, life is in service to the economy, which is in service to finance. What's wrong with this picture? Well, it's wrong way round. Finance is a tool to bring liquidity, money to a real economy that delivers the goods and services we need. And that economy should be in service to life. And this I think is the core of the new narrative. We need to move from a world that is degenerative where we are losing life to a world that in John Fullerton's phrase is regenerative capitalism. Pete Seeger, the humble folk singer, so the key to the future of the world is finding the optimistic stories and letting them be known. So how do we make a world in Bucky Fuller's terms that works for 100% of humanity? A group of us from around the world, an international team uh, made up of the group Alliance for Sustainability and Prosperity and the group that Steve mentioned, Leading for Wellbeing, have been beavering away on a new narrative Part of it is who are we as people? The neoliberal narrative says that who we are is greedy bastards. We're in it only for ourselves. Turns out you ask the anthropologists, the uh, evolutionary biologists, this isn't true. Humans, pre-humans, were down to something like 18,000 discrete individuals. We damn near went extinct. We didn't because we bonded. And why do we love Facebook? The evolutionary biologists say, it's in your DNA. You are here because you are the descendant of those who survived. And those who survived did so because they worked together. We're all so clever creatures. We love to invent and particularly we invent story. So what is our story going to be? Most activists try to fight the existing order. Bucky said, don't do that, build something better. Here is the prototypical narrative we've been working on, that we will only succeed if we create a world where everyone prospers and flourishes. And that institutions, government, civil society, serve us best when they recognize our individual dignity, but also our interconnectedness and that we must pivot toward a new purpose, shared prosperity on a healthy planet. We're working with 10 different areas. Our theory of change is follow what it is the neocons did and build a strategy for how it is we transform each of these areas. 
These principles that we put together with natural capitalism it are, we believe, how we get from where we are to where it is we need to be. You start by using resources more efficiently. You redesign the entire society using approaches like biomimicry, the circular economy, doing business the way nature does. And then you manage all institutions to be regenerative of human and natural capital. These are the forms of capital that our present system is liquidating. We believe that a finer future is possible. We can create a world that works for everyone. When we do this, we will unleash the greatest prosperity the world has ever known. As the science writer William Gibson said, the future's already here, it's just not widely distributed. And if you look at the incredible progress in things like renewable energy or the effort in communities to redesign how we live together, we have all the examples of how to build this finer future. We just need to get about it. So maybe that's enough to uh, get a conversation started. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks so much there, um, uh, Hunter. Uh, very good to get a conversation started. Um, I'm going to now move on to Alan White. Um, Alan, I've known for quite a few years now. We he is known as one of the co-founders of the uh, Global Reporting Initiative. He's with the TELUS Institute, uh, which uh, has worked with closely with the Stockholm uh, Environmental Institute. And uh, they had a project that was very interesting in its genesis uh, of his work that they've been doing as the Great Transitions Initiative over the past few years. Um, I think, uh, Alan, you're certainly representing the longest uh, in duration uh, work here of the three uh, speaking today in terms of the work of developing a new narrative. So welcome. Uh, we're keen on hearing your story. Whoops. We you're are muted. so keen on hearing that uh, I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Uh, you've muted yourself, Alan. Okay, is that better? Yep, that's much better, thank you. All right, are there slides visible on the screen? Or just yeah. me? Yes? Just you. Just me, okay. All right, are there slides now? There are indeed. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Always hard to, to follow Hunter's wisdom, but I'll do my best. Uh, I'm speaking to the Great Transition Initiative. This has its roots uh, about 25 years ago. So it's been around. It came in the wake of the Brundtland Commission report on our common future in 1987 a landmark report, of course, now 30 years old. In the early 90s, a group assembled to reflect on the Brundtland Report and to imagine how to give it life beyond simply another UN report, a UN-sponsored report. That led to the formation then in the early 90s of the Global Scenarios Group, a small group of about 15 individuals from different countries who came together to devise or develop a series of uh, imaginary futures and ask which future do we want, which future is possible, and how do we get there? Uh, as we see here, what evolved from that was a series of reflections, principles, scenarios, new knowledge and mobilization uh, efforts, all as it evolved in the 90s under the umbrella of uh, what became to be known as the Great Transition Initiative. As we developed this idea, we reflected on past social movements, of which of course there are many. many. There was the environmental movement, the original from the 1800s, more the modern post 1960s, there's the women's movement, the anti-apartheid movement, and 
<clears throat> human rights movements, movements of abundant civil rights movements. And we asked ourselves, what is it about these movements? What are the attributes that make some succeed and some not, some impactful and others not? We said, well, it seems to be at the end of the day, a combination, an alchemy, if you will, of timing, leadership, and what we called shared grievance. Something is wrong, needs to be fixed. An idea, a feeling shared by a broad base of people, even worldwide, perhaps they don't know each other, but their disagreement is something that bonds them, even if invisibly. We developed a set of principles, uh, basically our North Star, well-being, solidarity, ecological resilience. Those are the three. Others have variants on these, but if you ask the people on this call, probably no one would object to these three, even though others may have four or five or two or somewhat different. We thought scenarios was a way to organize our thinking, imagine the future along different pathways, what it might result, and of course, develop a body of knowledge by which we could better articulate the scenarios and understand how to achieve them. And finally, mobilization. How do we create agents and agency to move forward? Scenarios, as many of you know, are images of what may happen, plausible futures. Uh, they serve to fire the imagination. They serve to create really warning sig signals of hazards ahead and opportunities ahead. They help us generate knowledge to conceive and evaluate alternative pathways. And they provide, if this narrative is compelling, the social legitimacy to pursue it. Uh, uncertainty is uh, part of the scenario world, of course. We don't know the future for certain. We don't know it because either we're ignorant, we don't have the understanding of what is coming. Uh, there are always surprises. We can only pick up the paper today and yesterday and the last several months and note any number of surprises. And then, of course, is human volition. We have choices to make, and sometimes we make them wisely. Sometimes we make them, unfortunately, uh, to our detriment. So all these interplay and in uncertainty looms large in every decision making process and certainly in every scenario process. Uncertainty, the ignorance, surprise, the volition factors play into scenarios in what we call branch points. Whether we're policymakers, whether we're civil society people, business people, scholars, uh, we are subject to ignorance, surprises, and volition, and these inform scenarios and they make them stronger or weaker or more believable, less believable. There's many driving forces. Uh, many driving forces in uh, that uh, affect the future. These are some of them, of course, demographic, economic, social, technological, and so forth, environmental, and governance. In our world of the great transition, we have sought to uh, take a backcasting approach. Rather than forecasting based on current projections and realities and ask, where are we going? Uh, we say, where do we want to be? Back up and say, how do we get there? Where do we want to go and how do we get there? Those two are the key questions in scenario building. Where do we want to go? How do we get there? So let me walk you through our structure very quickly. We have a set of scenarios. One group is called market forces. This is an optimistic scenario where, much like uh, Hunter described coming out of the uh, Bretton Woods post-war period, rising tide will lift all boats, social environmental concerns are important, but secondary and growth is the name of the game and markets are the way you get there. Alan, I just had yeah. a request from the audience if you could move to presentation mode. They're having a bit of difficulty reading your slides based on the size of them. Oh, I'm sorry. If you just uh, click the second button on your, it says from current slide, just below there, just to the left. Nope, not that one. Cancel that, please. The uh, one, just to that one. This one? Yes, please. 
there you are. Thank sorry. you. Yeah, uh, sorry for that. Um, so that's this is a, we call market forces. And uh, this is a, a more business as usual world. You can see here business as usual, uh, markets will solve all problems. And uh, uh, certain assumptions, as Hunter pointed out, about the nature of the human consciousness, uh, competitive, selfish, self-serving, and accumulative. Uh, there are certain responses to market forces. You can introduce a variant on that we call policy reform, basically achieving, attempting to achieve sustainable development. Uh, and rely on government for interventions, be it through tax policy, trade policy, uh, social welfare policies, to modulate or moderate the uh, outcomes of markets, pure unfettered markets that are injurious to major segments of society. So policy reform is helpful, uh, but still in the in the uh, in the incremental mode. A second set of scenarios we call uh, loosely barbarization. Now these come in two forces. These are the dark side of the future. Fortress world comes about through uh, order imposed by strong leaders, uh, much militarism, armed forces that prevent outright collapse, and the rich retreat to enclaves the poor suffer. Now, these are pure scenarios of a very dark future, of course, a pure scenario. Although, if you think about the world today, this does not look totally unfamiliar. Uh, there's another variant on uh, uh, what we call the barbarization twosome, the fortress world, and a second uh, variant besides uh, fortress world plus breakdown. It's another dark future. Institutions fail to address social, environmental, economic stability, spiraling conflict and crisis. And you see here a picture of the uh, outcome of that. Now, again, think about the world today. Think about the failed states and the failing states, whether it's Somalia, Eritrea, Syria. This is not an unfamiliar scene. Afghanistan, uh, change the faces, uh, change the uh, attire, and you see a world today, unfortunately, that has some resemblance to this picture on your screen. Onward to a uh, third uh, group of twosome, we call these, these are great transition scenarios. One is more a, we call eco-communalism. It's a bioregionalistic localism, face-to-face -face democracy, economic autarky, small is beautiful tradition, which of course is alive and well in practice and in practice and is the source of uh, much attention and much hope. Make things local, produce local, consume local, interact local, and uh, the world will be a better place. And of course, many experiments, uh, transition cities, uh, all kinds of, in the US, of course, Canada, many advocates of this future. And it's a future that uh, many of us, certainly a, not a pure future, not everywhere, all the time, everywhere, but certainly elements of this are appealing and attractive. And finally, a great transition this is uh, where we spent most of our time, where solidarity leads to greater equity, new values emphasize quality of life and environmental stewardship, and economic growth uh, is sub subsumed or subordinated to well-being, solidarity, and e ecological resilience. Now, the pictures I've shown you here are prototypes, of course, and in the world of our future, a future that we call in, our, in this great transition initiative, Earthland, which you can read about at the website on this lower left. Earthland describes a composite world. Uh, basically, seeing you have in front of you some eco-communalism, there are markets, there is private ownership of property, there's also strong government intervention, and more importantly, there's a value shift, a value shift toward solidarity, toward well-being, and toward ecological resilience. It tries to distinguish uh, between, uh, sorry, uh, between uh, the proximate drivers and the ultimate drivers. By proximate drivers, we mean change the, uh, these are things we see in the world operating today. Institutions and uh, commerce and policies, these are instruments for managing the future. <laughs> when in fact, uh, while those can change, 
the deeper chains, the deeper change comes at a deeper level, and that is ultimate drivers. Ultimately, why do we create certain institutions like we did after the war? Why do we live the way we do? There you have to look more inside the human consciousness and address issues such as power relations and value systems and culture and knowledge. Those ultimately are what drive transformation and the symptoms, the outcomes of those value shifts, knowledge shifts, culture shifts, power shifts are different kinds of institutions, policies, and so forth. So in the Great Transition Initiative to conclude, we're continuously building knowledge. Uh, we invite you to look at the website, greattransition.org. This is a four-year-old effort to build a body of knowledge through uh, writings, dialogue, uh, interviews with prominent thinkers, to create knowledge that can and provide the foundation for going forward, drawing on all, all the concepts that we need to address, whether it's sustainable consumption, whether it's global governance, whether it's new forms of business and enterprise. So we're continuing to do that through our online journal. Next, leadership development. We have a cadre of 1,000 individuals worldwide who are active participants in this effort, the Great Transition Initiatives. We are constantly screening uh, with their help, which is very interactive and co-creative, seeking those leaders, whether they be in Africa, South America, India, wherever, who are uh, un who are on the in the realm and understand and have been active in this whole great transition uh, activity and are ready to take up the mantle. These could be existing organizations, they could be individuals who have not yet been identified, all kinds of people. And so we are cultivating leadership to take this whole program forward and make it real, not just simply theoretical. And finally, mobilization. It's our view that while uh, actors in the world today, be they civil society, be they government, be they business, there's much enlightenment uh, around that can be harnessed. But perhaps the missing actor that has not been mobilized and needs to be are citizens at the individual level. So we speak in the great transition world of a global citizens movement a movement that would bind together not tens and twenties, but millions of people worldwide into a common cause informed by the principles I've described here and with a shared vision of uh, the possible future. All of what I said in the last few minutes has immense amount of documentation behind it, including quantitative models of the future uh, around resources, around global governance, all kinds of material uh, so we are well beyond the uh, uh, talking stage or the imagination stage and the thinking stage. We have documentation and we know what's possible and we believe we can achieve it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alan. Uh, wonderful to see the progress you're making. Uh, a more recent effort is emerging with the B Team, a uh, very interesting initiative, the B Team. It's a radical network of businesses which, uh, for which uh, development of a meta-narrative has uh, come to the fore as a particular topic. And we're pleased to be able to have Rajiv Jossi, with us. He's the director of the B team. Uh, he's had a, a large range of experience in different global networks and actions. And welcome, Rajiv. Keen on hearing about where you're going with the meta narrative and transformation work at B team. Whoops. Mike. <laughs> Ah, that's it. Okay. Um, can you see my screen and there my you face? Or can you just see my face? We can indeed see your screen uh, and your face. And it would be great if you can go into presentation mode with your, screen, your slides. Um, yes, although it's, I'm just doing it one second. Um, full screen. Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much to Steve and the team at uh, Future Earth and um, the other partners for inviting the B team to be part of this webinar. We're delighted to speak to many of you and recognize that this is a critical moment in human history where we all need to be thinking carefully 
about the future and how we can also shape policy in the present to get to a future which preserves our ecosystems and the life which the ecosystems that life depends on. And the B team is really looking at this from the perspective of business and I think Hunter um, and uh, Alan have really provided a really good context to build on here and Hunter I think looked at um, business as one of the key dimensions that we need to focus on in terms of transformation and I'll try to speak a little bit more from that perspective um, in terms of how do we redefine the role of business in society which is a critical reason why the B team was formed and the B team um, is really trying to shift from a world in which we've emphasized a single bottom line of profit maximization, short-term profit maximization, towards looking at a future where companies exist to maximize social, environmental, as well as economic benefit. And um, the way we're trying to get there is by catalyzing a movement. My, my own background is as a, a, an activist, I'm working alongside um, leaders in the anti-poverty movement, um, worked with the Global Call to Action Against Poverty, which was founded by Nelson Mandela and spent a lot of time with Oxfam. And we're trying to bring some of the thinking around how to organize um, to how do we organize a corporate movement of business leaders that are willing to take a moral uh, stance in their own companies to lead by example and also work together to change the rules. And we started in 2013. There are leaders from around the world. Um, currently, we have around 23. Um, around a third of the team are self-made entrepreneurs like Richard Branson, Mark Benioff, Guillermo Lial from Brazil and Natura. Um, a third are appointed CEOs like Paul Pullman, who's obviously a big champion of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, individuals like Bob Collymore from Safaricom. Um, and then we also have civil society leaders like Mary Robinson, Sharon Burrow, who leads the international trade union movement, um, and Yolanda Kakabadze from WWF. And the idea is really to build that virtuous cycle of leadership um, that can really point to some of the most critical issues, but also demonstrate what change uh, needs to happen through leading by example in their own organizations. And as Adam Smith said, people the same trade seldom meet together except for merriment and self-fulfillment and uh, one of the reasons we have civil society in the room is because we know that um, it's it's much more powerful when um, it's not just business meeting by itself in a trade association or in in a, in a group but when you have activists sitting together with business leaders the issues can really be discussed debated and we really get to the heart of the issues at the b team um, when we launched, we had around 1,200 events in 474 cities around the world, in boardrooms, in community centers, with people sending us ideas around what are the biggest challenges currently preventing business from driving sustainable development, from, from achieving the world that we want, and, and driving social, environmental, and economic benefit. And we came across a set of 10 um, challenges that I won't speak through each one, but they are on our website on bteam.org. They, they span a spectrum from short termism and you know shifting toward longer long run um, mindsets within companies. And you know we've seen that recently with companies often that are forced by shareholders in acting and making decisions on a very short term horizon um, toward you know other challenges like collaboration. How do we how do we truly get trade unions and, and civil society and government and, and business to work together? The market incentives. How do we? Sorry, uh, I think there's a phone. Uh, thank you. I'm not, I don't think it's on my end. Has it gone? Yes. Ah, oh, okay. Just getting back to the slideshow. Um, if others could just mute, that would help, I think. Um, 
toward incentives. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we face is that our economy is um, consisting of incentives that incentivize bad and don't necessarily incentivize good. And so we, what we want to do is really start to really up the ante on issues like fossil fuel subsidies. I mean, why do we have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars going into subsidizing fossil fuels rather than subsidizing uh, renewable energy? And you know, these are the kinds of questions that we need to shift. And some of the founders, like Jochen Zeitz, um, who co-chairs the B team with Richard Branson, one of the reasons that they founded the B team was when he was at Puma, he did a full environmental profit and loss of their value chain and realized that you know, the, one of the biggest impacts, and they reported and published in their EP&L, a 300 million euro negative impact. But one of the biggest impacts was from the use of leather as a key material in the value chain of Puma. And it was very difficult for Puma to shift uh, leather out of its value chain when a cow is subsidized to the tune of two euros a day in the EU and maintains its price as a lower cost material than those that would be more sustainable. And therefore, you know, business increasingly needs to look at how it can influence the rules of the game in a positive way um, to level the playing field in those kinds of areas. So incentives are actually a very critical part of the agenda. We look at transparency and governance. Um, Hunter talked about restoring and regenerating nature. How do we, how do we nurture the kinds of business models that actually um, don't just have uh, reducing harm as their objective, but actually they're net positive in terms of their impact on people and planet. How do we get the right kind of accounting so that businesses are looking at the triple bottom line? Um, how do we value diversity? How do companies have the right reward systems that tie their performance to the social and environmental performance of, of their companies? You know, compensation systems today are not only um, out of whack with a you know, 400 to one CEO to worker pay ratio in the US alone, but also we're not incentivizing executives to drive companies according to their social environmental targets. And so we need to look at that. Um, so they're the challenges that we came up with. And the way we approach it is by leading by example and you know, getting companies to, um, to, to, for example, on, on transparency to end anonymous companies, getting groups of companies to publish their own corporate ownership structures in open structured data and in a machine readable format so that we can start to combat illicit flows of capital. Um, and then get other companies to do the same and work with the G20 on policy to you know, get countries like the UK to put registries in place that require companies to register their ownership structures is one way on, on governance that we were able to shift the needle. Um, and often this is through partnering and existing uh, organisations trying to accelerate the, the efforts of civil society by bringing business to the table. Um, also using our voice, you know, in Paris, for example, the B team was on the ground, um, really bringing business uh, leadership to the table, pushing governments to be more ambitious, giving them ground cover, creating uh, that political space that de-risks the political process. And you know, I think many of you will have seen in the last um, few weeks that you know the world was very concerned about the Paris Agreement and the potential credible threat the US withdrawal would pose to the process, but by mobilizing business behind the scenes, by getting states and cities and civil society to come together and say, regardless of the position that Trump takes, we are pushing ahead, we are going to deliver on the Paris Agreement, our companies are going to commit to the targets that they had already set out to commit to, and we're doing it because there's a clear and compelling business case to do so. We, in some ways, circumvented um, uh, what could have been a pretty disastrous uh, process for Paris and in fact in some ways may have even strengthened the momentum um, behind the Paris Agreement with um, even more uh, awareness and even more desire to get to a net zero greenhouse gas emissions economy by 2050 which the world needs to meet. Um, so we have, you know, we work on three key areas, the governance work, the net zero by 2050 and then also uh, business and human rights. We, we're trying to get companies to treat their employees as 100% human and uh, something which Hunter also emphasized. Um, 
it's worth uh, also, um, I think I may have switched to slideshows here, one second. Um, um, here we go. Um, Emphasising that if you look at primary energy use, if you look at carbon dioxide emissions, if you look at water use, you can see the, the way in which our consumption is skyrocketing in this Anthropocene era that we've now entered. And so we need to find ways of business which is responsible for significant uh, proportion of this impact and also that uh, impacts on consumers of shifting its behavior. Look at tropical forest loss and look at Johan Rockström's framework, for example, of planetary boundaries. You can see that you know, we're already in the red when it comes to biosphere integrity. Um, we're already you know, shifting into the unsafe zone on climate change, which we're aware of. We're already um, in the red on nitrogen bio ge geochemical flows, phosphorus flows. And th these things are really shifting our, our Earth system. And so the narrative currently, you know, it doesn't necessarily t um, kind of emphasize the fierce urgency that we face. You know, if you look, for example, at the, the coral reefs that only in 2014 were healthy, that are dying in 2015, and that were dead in, in, in the middle of 2015. Um, in, in, in many parts of the world, you know, it just emphasizes the, the way in which our biodiversity can, can collapse. If you look at the levels of ocean acidification that we're seeing in different parts of the world, if you look at the projected sea level rise, the, the reduction in the Antarctic ice shelf, if you looked at the costs that we are, for example, um, seeing on, on inaction on climate change, uh, racking up to 44 trillion by 2060 as extreme weather events continue to you know, emerge, you see that the costs of inaction are, are, are much greater than the costs uh, of, of action. The, the second part of this uh, puzzle is that you know, we're, we're also yes. trying to ta ta tackle this at the same time as we have the greatest level of inequality uh, on the planet with three and a half billion people living in poverty and 1% of uh, uh, wealth, uh, uh, you know, greater than 99% of those. Um, and then we obviously have the sustainable development goals as a, as a roadmap, um, but we only have 13 years left to deliver on those goals. So just to conclude, um, we've done a report uh, that's worth looking at, which sets out that although uh, we need $2.4 trillion to reach the sustainable development goals per year, um, they actually represent a $12 trillion market of uh, opportunity if you look at four economic systems in food, cities, energy, health and well-being. Um, it's called Better Business, Better World and, and you should look at it, looks at um, over 60 different markets. And, and, and this is starting to shift the narrative within business and, and getting business to see the opportunity of investing in a slightly different approach and, and looking at the SDGs as a, as a market opportunity. Um, I, I'll try to conclude there, and then maybe so much, yeah. I'm just going to try and un unmute my microphone. Um, hopefully, that just provides a bit of context, and um, we hope to, as, as the B team, uh, be able to be part of this discussion and shift the narrative towards one of opportunity and not just one of doom and gloom. Thanks. Um, I'd like to encourage people to put a questions in the question box uh, if they have some to share. I'd like to suggest first of all, uh, that we um, that the uh, panelists uh, talk about what they see as uh, the connections between these different efforts. I often think in terms of ecosystems. So the ecosystem for, de for developing a meta-narrative is one way to think about it. It's not a question of having massive coordination and centralization. It's seeing uh, the relationships between different works and um, how they can support one another. And uh, so I'd just be interested in uh, some reflections from the three of you on what you see is the relationship between uh, what you're all doing here. Maybe we could start with Hunter and go in the order of uh, people speaking. One of the interrelationships is that many of us uh, work with each other on a regular basis. So for example, Steve, you were at our meeting in New York. I serve on the B-Team Advisory Board. I'm a member of the Great Transitions 
uh, conversation. And this, I think, we need to do a great deal more. Our movement is a bucket of crabs. As soon as any one of us starts to gain elevation, the rest claw them down. Hey, it's me, it's me, I, I need the money. What we have to do, in my humble opinion, is what the neolibs did, which is come together, have a common agreed narrative. It won't be what all of what each of us has been working on, but it's a platform for all of us to go forward and then make a dedicated effort to support the initiatives of each other. Whenever something comes up, say, yep, I'm in that. Yep, I'm in that. And begin to learn to work together in a coordinated way. Our opponents do this very successfully. And you know, the, a great example of that is what B Team did with We Mean Business. A number of organizations, B Team, Carbon Disclosure Project, all came together to put forth a common platform that businesses could align behind, enormously powerful. And when you go to government, when you go to other businesses and say, we have 6 million companies around the world that have said that they want to be a part of this, enormously powerful. Wonderful. Thank you. Alan, your thoughts on this question? Whoops, you've got to unmute. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Steve. There, there um, you are. Yeah, so uh, spot on. We are in this, uh, I can use the term loosely, movement, a bit hyperactive. We, we move so much in, uh, in so many directions that it's hard for the outside world to see any cohesion, any vanguard, any unity as to where we're going. And that, that's a problem. Uh, the uh, movement makers, the movement thinkers, the doers, the activists. Uh, we are often guilty of what uh, we critique in others, which is uh, uh, extreme competitiveness and often sometimes even exclusionary behaviors. You know, I'm doing this better than you, thank you very much. So that's a challenge for all of us. I think we have to look at ourselves in the face and say, how can we make one plus one plus one equal six, seven, and eight? And the only way to do that is through harmonization and, and coordination. Uh, <clears throat> easier said than done. I'm not naive and I've been in this too long, but I know that it is possible and where it does happen, great things can result. The other thing I mentioned quickly is that we need to always remember that, and Steve will, uh, I'm sure, applaud this. We have to think about systems and structures as uh, the introduction uh, words in the introduction. It's, it's fine to do better climate policy and it's fine to do uh, uh, corporate uh, responsibility and it's fine to do this and that. Uh, but we, we need to look beyond the isolated issues, all of which need attention, not to, not to debate that. But think about what is, why do we face these issues to begin with? What is the underlying structures that create the kind of chaos in the Middle East we see these days and the severe disparities that we saw on the screen, Rajiv's uh, graphs. What is it that undergirds the, dis the immense disparities, the instabilities, uh, suffering and so forth that we see in the world today? So there we have to look straight in the eye of uh, at a deeper level about power relations, about uh, economic economic uh, structures, or about, about ownership, and other drivers that are deeply embedded in the systems uh, that, that drive the outcomes that we see. So it's not too good enough to just reform and improve and incremental, incremental eyes our way forward. We have to dig deeper than that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alan. Alan. Rajiv. Yeah, I, I think it, I agree with um, both of my 
partners in crime that it's about connecting struggles and we you know we cannot in any way see this as you know a a, a, a series of disconnected um groups working on different parts of the agenda but actually we have to increasingly um find ways of 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 seeing what we're doing as being part of a movement to really um, radically shift in a very short time period the structures and systems um, that currently manage um, the way in which our economic system uh, is organized and we need to do that in ways which really engage the public. I think one of the challenges that we as a community face is that we have been in a bubble for quite a long time and we speak to each other so much <laughs> we are often at the same conferences and same meetings and we need to find ways of taking this um, knowledge uh, of where we currently are, um, the, the risk of where we currently might be if we do nothing and the uh, answers that we have around what the potential pathways are, whether that's universal basic income, whether that's um, carbon dividends and, and whether that uh, carbon cap and, cap and trade or whatever the policy solutions are, we need to find ways of wrapping these um, these into stories and, and, and finding ways of communicating these to the public which don't come across as wacky liberal ideas that are so far-fetched that they're never going to come, come, come into being, but that come across as, you know, fiercely urgent um, campaigns that we need people to get behind um, in order to protect their own livelihoods. And, and that means you know, we need to speak to people in their own language. So speaking to people in, in a much better language, um, working together in a much more coordinated way where we are more than the sum of our parts by subsuming our own identities. You know, I think a lot of the time people uh, you know, come into the room with their hats on and I think we need to be, sorry Hunter, I would love your hat. <laughs> You're the only one who's allowed to wear a hat. But taking our hats, up, our, our imaginary hats off and saying what is our common mission uh, and let's make that the metric and then how do we work towards it and put our assets on the table and then figure out you know who's who's got the communications who's got the advocacy who can help on the policy um, and then figure out you know and that's often how we did it in we mean business thanks so much uh, from the three of you uh, um, just looking at the chat box here we have some uh, comments Sandra Waddock is, is the commenting that systems and structures need to change. Um, GRLI needs to be included as well. They want to get a network of networks going. Um, also conscious capitalism, which could be affiliated with it all. Um, so thanks so much uh, for uh, that. Uh, it's a great um, conversation that we're having here. Uh, I would like to just recognize we haven't been able to engage um, everyone else uh, the way that we would uh, like to in these types of webinars. Uh, it's the time is now five to the hour. Um, I'd like to just uh, turn to the, uh, Resnat Niazzi. Uh, you've had a couple of comments here, uh, Resnat. I'm not sure that we'll be able to have time to get them, get to them here, the answers, but if you would be able to turn on your microphone, um, perhaps you could just share some of your thoughts and we could get people maybe to give you some thoughts um, by email or uh, some other way as well. But um, can you turn on your microphone? Yep, you should be able to speak now, Riznet. Zinat's uh, microphone is on, yes. but perhaps there is no audio connection. This happens sometimes. So sorry on, on Zinat's end if that's frustrating. Ah, okay. um, occasionally this happens, that it seems like there's a, the mic is open, but for whatever reason. So go ahead, Steve. Okay, well, I will just read out and we can connect afterwards, Resnet, if you want to contact us. Uh, resource efficiencies will probably be driven by business because of risks of resource scarcities, the question for labor maximization with higher skill 
is still quite unclear. Efficiency also drives automation, automation and the reduction of present jobs. Are there strong cases that can argue for new jobs, more jobs, and faster job creation and higher value jobs? This is a big concern for developing nations such as India. Um, so we need to integrate that into any story, responses to that into any story, um, just to recognize the, um, the value of your uh, reflection there, Resnet, and uh, we'll uh, share that with our speakers to see if they have any particular references. I think, Alan, you've done a lot of work, you have a lot of resources available, maybe you could share something. Um, so we're coming up to the end of the hour. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation. Uh, I'd like to also share with you the announcement for our next webinar. It will be, the topic is developing the ecosystem for financing transformation with the SDGs, a foundation and science view. And we're pleased to have uh, Benjamin Bell who's the executive director of the Worldwide Initiative for Grantmaker Support, uh, Marcos Netter, Neto, who's uh, been leading the development with the UNDP and others for the SDG Philanthropic Forum, and Erica Key, who is the executive director of the Belmont Forum, which is a key supporter here of uh, Future Earth. So we'll be looking at actually how we can um, the different, some of the different financing uh, opportunities for supporting all of this transformation work. So I hope you can join us. It's Wednesday, uh, June 21st, and uh, you can find out more information on that on the, and register at the Future Earth website with the transformation webinars. I'll now just refer to Christina. Uh, we are going to have this uh, recording posted on that site as well. Christina, would you like to say some words to wrap up too? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone, for attending the webinar. Sorry for seeing all the questions there for a moment. Uh, in the screen in front of you, you should see the, the advertisement for the webinar that Steve has just mentioned, and you can follow the links there to attend the, the next session. And for this session, the recording and slides will be available online next week, uh, as it is Friday now. Um, so early next week, you'll get an email with a link to those. Um, that you can follow up and redo or what what have you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Look forward to continuing forward. the conversation in other spaces too. For the questions, yeah. Good to chat with y'all. Thanks. Bye now.